everybody staying awake. Because I know I'd, I'd usually take a nap after school and those lights turned out and, and that pew was feeling quite comfy. Today, we, or tonight, I'd like to preach about the unity of the kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of God. I thought about kingdoms And one kingdom came to mind as I was preparing this sermon, and that was the kingdom of Greece, Alexander's kingdom of Greece. You know, Alexander, he was about 17,000 miles away from his home. He had marched all the way to the borders of India with his men, conquering all the nations in his way. He was a young man, one that was ahead of his time, we would say. And at the Hyphasis River, one of the rivers of India, he had already fought a battle. He had already defeated a general. But his men decided that they had gone far enough. And the man that had just conquered the known world, was standing at the edge of the world, he thought, with more land, more area to conquer. And for three days, he fought with his men, trying to convince them to go further with him. But eventually he gave in, and that great king turned back to go back home. Most of his men fell in Pakistan from hardship. And Alexander will return to Babylon, a country that he had conquered, and that's where he would meet his death. Division. Division broke that great kingdom. Broke the kingdom of Greece. It was separated then into four pieces and eventually it was taken over and was formed into the Roman Empire. Such a great kingdom fell from division church. And now let's think of another kingdom, a greater kingdom with a greater king whose name is Christ, whose name is Jesus, and that kingdom is his church. Is that kingdom divided? Today, You know, divisions in the kingdom of Christ, they started early off in Christianity. Some of the Greek ideas came in. The Jews tried to break it up, tried to bind the law of Moses on the people. Division was common. But as the years passed, more division and more division occurred. And eventually, you could hardly see the church. In history. And so today, we do not seek division. We see what division caused. We see that it just breaks down and it destroys kingdoms. We seek unity. We do not seek that division that's caused by men. Notice what the church is called throughout Scripture. Go to Ephesians 1, 22. And 23, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, Paul would say, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is described as the body of Christ. Well, how many bodies did he have? Well, you go to Ephesians chapter 4. And look at verse 4. He says, there is one body. Later on in that book of a, or that chapter around verse 6, it says there's one God and Father of all, who's above all and through all, and He's in you all. And so just as there is one God, church, who is perfectly united, in whom there is no division at all, there's one body, the church, that is perfectly united 
in which there is no division at all, the body of Christ, the church of Christ. Before Britain started speaking, I found a, a young lady, and she said she was the preacher's daughter, May Lee. I guess that's the preacher's daughter. And, and I asked her to draw me something. And I asked her to draw me a, a, just, a, just a stick man. And she, she understood what I was saying. If you can see that, that's what she drew. You notice he has one body. That he has one head. You see, children, they understand that. But then I asked her, now can you draw me another one that has one head, but that has a lot of bodies? And she said, what? <laughs> and I had to explain, just, just give them one head and... And give them a lot of bodies, and, and then she came up with this. So he has one big head and a lot of little bodies. That's not natural. That, that's not what, what a child is used to seeing. That's not what we are used to seeing. But now what do we look out in the world, and what do we see? And what do the denominations think? Oh, they think there's one head but a lot of bodies, but we can see that that's just not the case. That's not natural. That's, that's not a normal thing. No, there's one body and there's one head, the King, Christ Jesus. We do not seek to be divided. We seek unity. One said it like this, I would rather be the Roman soldier who thrust his spear into the side of Christ and divided his flesh than to be the one that split the body of Christ, the church of Christ, into pieces. And I agree with that. Because see, the Roman soldier, he can be forgiven of that. But the one who divides the body of Christ, if judgment comes before he repents, before the damage is dealt with, that's a person who cannot be forgiven if it's not repented of. And so we do not seek division today. Well, what is that one body then? What is that one church? Which one is right? And you'll go to Matthew chapter 16, 16 through 18, where our master was talking to the disciples. He said, whom do men say that I am? And they threw out all their answers, but Peter's the one that got it right. He said, thou art the Christ the Son of the living God. In Christ, He says, you're blessed. That flesh and blood is not revealed this unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. And He says, and upon this rock, I will build my church. Well, which rock was that? The rock that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. He was going to build His church. Notice He said, my church. Not another man's church. Not anybody else's church. Christ's church. Well, how would he build that? Go to Acts 20 and verse 28. Paul said to the Ephesian elders, Take heed unto yourselves and all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God. How was it purchased? He purchased it with his own blood. What about all these other churches? Were they purchased by the blood of Christ? Churches that bear the name of men like Luther or bear names like Baptist and Methodist. I have family in the Pentecostal church. Did Christ purchase these as well? No. See, He only purchased His church, His one church with His own blood. He gave for it. And so what about these other churches now? These denominations? We'll go to the book of Psalms. Psalm 127 and verse 1. God said, Except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. If God did not build that church, the ones who built it, their labor is nothing but vain. Why is that? Because there's only one true church. 
Any church other than that was built in vain. And that's as truthful and that's as plain and that's hopefully as loving as we can put it. All churches built by man, brethren, friends, were built in vain. Well, you say, well, you can't say that. I have family in this church and in that church, and I have friends in that church. I have family in those churches as well. I have friends in those churches as well. But we got to remember what Jesus said in Matthew 15 and verse 13. But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. That is why our responsibility is so great. Like Britain said, these people, they are good people. They think that they are worshiping God in spirit and truth. And brethren, we have the truth. That's why we need to tell them this is not the way to do it. You're not in the right place as loving and as compassionate as possible. But brethren, we need to tell them the truth. <clears throat> they say, well, we're all going to the same place. We're just taking different paths. Daniel brought up that I'm moving out to Colorado. If I went east, I wouldn't end up in Colorado. If I went north, I would not end up in Colorado. If I went south, I would not end up in Colorado. No, I have to drive west if I want to go to Colorado. Brethren, we cannot go different directions and end up at the same place. So what do we have to do? We have to go down the right path. Jesus said in Matthew 7 and verse 13, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to, to destruction, but straight is the gate. Difficult is the way that leads into everlasting life. There's only two paths we can go down. There's only two directions that we can go, and one is straight, and one is wide, and most of the world is going to take the latter, the wide way. That's the responsibility we have to warn these people, to try to guide these people then, because we do not seek division. We seek to be unified in the body of Christ. Do you know division, it's condemned in the Bible. In 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10, if you go there, the Corinthian church, some were saying, I, I'm of Paul. I, I'm of Paulos. And some were even saying, I'm of Christ. I'm, I'm better than you. You know, you're from Paul and Apollos, but, but I'm, from, I'm from Jesus Christ. But what did Paul tell them in verse 10 of 1 Corinthians? He said, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing. Do the denominations speak the same thing? No, we, they don't. Do we speak the same thing as them? No, we don't. We can see that, that there's division then. That we're not speaking the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, he said, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. So how many divisions does God put up with then? None at all. He said that there be none among you, no divisions among you. He wants us to be perfectly joined together in the same mind, he says. We need to agree on the same things, and we'll see how we do that later in the sermon. But division, it is condemned. In Galatians 5 and verse 20, Paul calls it a work of the flesh, not a fruit of the Spirit. In Romans 16, 17 and 18, we'll see the reason why people divide. He says, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. Why? For they are such that serve not the Lord Jesus Christ. But what do they serve? It says their own bellies. And by good words and fair speeches, deceive the hearts of the simple. So they are people that serve their own bellies. They say, this is good for me. This, this helps me out. Preaching this type of, type of message, type of message helps me out. 
puts more money in my pocket. They say things like, you can be saved by just saying the sinner's prayer. You can be saved by just accepting the Lord Jesus into your heart. By fair speeches, and they deceive the hearts of the simple. These things should not be. But they were happening even in the times of Paul, and they are happening today. That's the problem. What is now the solution to the problem? We'll go to Jeremiah chapter 6 in verse 16. You know, Jeremiah, he was prophesying at a time where Israel was on the brink of destruction. Judah, you know, that Babylon was coming to town, what God says. And there were people there in verse 14, and, and they were preaching peace, peace. But he says, but there was no peace. There are people in our times that are preaching peace and love and joy and happiness. But there's not. Not to the state that they're in. But what does Jeremiah say in verse 16 of chapter 6? He says, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the way and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. And ye shall find rest for your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. People get the misconception that we are asking them to join our denomination. But that's not what we're asking. We're asking them to seek the old paths. Go back to the start. Go back to New Testament Christianity. Follow just the Word of God. Seek the old paths. We're asking them to be a part of that church. Not a denomination, but the one that was made by Christ. We do not seek division. We seek unity. Go to John chapter 17 and we'll get our second point. John 17 and verse 11. <clears throat> this is the Lord's prayer. A time when Christ was about to be taken and about to be killed. This is what was on our master's mind before he would leave this earth. John he recorded for us the words of Christ, And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to thee. Holy Father, keep thou thine own name, those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are one. The dying wish of Christ was that his followers, his believers, would be one. He prayed for unity. But he did not only pray for the apostles. Go to verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. Did you believe on Christ through the words of the apostles? Maybe the words of Paul that were written down. The words of John. I believe many of us have. He's talking to us. That believed on him through their word. That they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me into the world. So Christ's wish is for his believers, for his followers to be one. See, Christ, he wanted unity. He wanted them to be unified in that one body, in that one church. So that is what we seek after today. How do we do that? John 17 and verse 17. But sanctify them by truth. Thy word is truth. You know in the times we live in, this is about the only true thing that we have. The only firm thing that we have, and that's the word of God. But why is it so firm? Well, we notice that God does not change. In Psalm 90 and verse 2. It says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, Thou art God. From eternity to eternity, He's the same God. He will always be the same God. God does not change. Malachi 3 and verse 6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. James 1 says, There's no variableness. There's no shadow of turning in a way that says, God does not change. So God does not change, brethren. 
Christ does not change as well. In Hebrews 13 and verse 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today forever. So since they are eternal beings, since they are beings that do not change, is their word going to change then? Is the truth going to change? No. It's going to stand forever. Psalm 119 and verse 160 says, Thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. How long will God's righteous judgments endure? He says forever. To eternity they will endure. And so we can take this word. John 8 verse 32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. We can know the truth of this word. People say, well, there's just so many different ways to interpret it. So many different ways to understand it. But Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. I'm going to trust the words of Christ. I'm going to trust that we can come together on truth. The simple truth. The Word of God. So we can all speak the same thing. Paul said back in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10 that they may all speak the same thing. But now let's get to the church real quick. Anti. Liberal. Conservative. Black. White. All these different types of congregations we have. Brethren, why can't we just be biblical? Why can't when somebody says, well, what kind of church of Christ or are you? I'm a biblical one. I'm one that goes by the book. I'm one that, that opens up the Word of God and that's what it says. That's what it says. We have divisions even in the body of Christ and it should not be so. So what do we need to do? Seek the old paths. Go back to the book. Go back to what the Bible says. And this is why it's so important, brethren. And if you don't get anything else out of this sermon, get this. If we are divided, it will hinder the work of Christ. It will hinder the work of God. Amos wrote in Amos 3 and verse 3, Can two walk together unless they be agreed? No, they can't. If we don't agree on this, then we can't work together. Then we can't walk together. That's why we have to seek unity. But notice back in John 17, verse 21, what the Lord said in this beautiful verse. He said that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me into the world. Why did Christ want all of his followers to be one? that the world may know that God sent His Son into the world. You take people that are rich, that are poor, you take people from different backgrounds in life, from different places, and they all come together in this one beautiful church, this one body of Christ, and you take one that's not saved, that walks through the door on a Sunday or a Wednesday, and they see all these people getting along and working together and glorifying God, and they know that God sent His Son into the world. That's why we seek unity. We seek unity. We do not seek division. Finally, just for a few moments, brethren, we seek unity with God. We seek to be unified with God one day. How do we do that? Well, Ephesians 2 and verse 16, speaking of Christ, and that He might reconcile both unto God in one body, by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Tonight you must be in the one body of Christ. If you haven't done that, you must hear what Christ did for you, that, that He died for your sins, that He left heaven, He came to earth for you, that He died, that He was raised again the third day, and believe that with all your heart. If you would repent of your sins, Change the mind of how you're going to live. Confess the name of Christ. Oh, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And if you believe He is, then why wouldn't you confess it? Be baptized into Christ. Well, you'll be added to that body, to that one united body of believers and begin living your life faithfully until you die. 
We must be in that one body. But notice 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 11. He says, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. If we want God to be with us, if we hope one day to be with God, brethren, we have to be of one mind. And the only way to do that is by this word right here. We have to come together on that. We have to believe the same truth. Be of one mind. Because if we're not, the work of God will be hindered. And finally, if you will go to me, go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And I promise this is the last verse. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 and 17. If we've lived faithfully, we'll be unified with God. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Or for comfort one another with these words. Brethren, do you desire that? I know that you do. If you have not obeyed the gospel tonight, then you're not in that body of Christ. That's where you belong. That's where you need to be. You need to come. But if you have obeyed the gospel tonight, maybe it is that you have fallen back into sin. Maybe it's that you need to be unified with God again. Come. Let us be in that united body of Christ. Brethren, we seek unity. If you need to be unified with God tonight, come as we stand and as we sing.